Okay, um, so I guess it's already 11. Um, so I want to uh, welcome you all to this side event, uh, co-organized by Child 10 and the Council of the Baltic Sea States. So I'm Elisa Toon, I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at Child 10, an anti-child trafficking organization based in Stockholm and Vienna. And during this event, we are very fortunate to have a long list of distinguished speakers presenting a variety of viewpoints to enhance our collective understanding of how trafficking and sexual exploitation of children is happening both offline and online, and how victim identification and access to services and justice can be improved. We will also discuss how to enhance cross-border and cross-sectoral collaboration and cooperation. Uh, just uh, some technical information. Um, if you have any questions to the speakers, please share them in the chat. Feel free to also uh, shortly present who you are and who you are directing your question to. And we'll try to address as many questions as possible after the initial intervention of the speakers. Now, I want to start off this side event by uh, first thanking the OSE for organizing the Alliance Against Trafficking Conference. And we are very thankful that the special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings uh, of the OSCE, Val Ritchie, is here today to deliver the opening remarks. So uh, Val, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Elisa, and thanks uh, to you and to your partners for organizing this event. I think it's a fantastic uh, build on the, on the topic of child uh, protection and child trafficking that's been addressed. I'm really delighted to welcome everyone here um, to this event jointly organized by Child 10 and the Council of Baltic Sea States, uh, which, by the way, is one of our longstanding partners in the Alliance Expert Coordination Team, so it's great to, to see Eddie. Um, it is indeed very timely and relevant, and I think really complements, as I just said, the discussion that we had just yesterday in the Child Protection Panel at the Alliance Conference. As you heard yesterday, uh, the situation is actually quite shocking. Um, as a global community, we've been working on trying to address child trafficking for quite a long time now. But in the last 15 years, during all that work, the rate of child victims has gone from 13% of cases to 34% of cases. The situation's gotten much worse. And I think that uh, poses a real challenge to us as a global community to try to figure out what to do. Uh, but it's clear that we're not doing enough. One crucial need that has been highlighted and I think will be discussed by the great speakers today is the need for better systems. Um, numerous OSCE documents call on participating states to create mechanisms and frameworks that would specifically address protection and assistance measures for trafficked children. They urge states to ensure a durable solution for every child victim in the child's best interests. And these solutions will not be adequately addressed without functional and effective protection systems in place. Equally important, these comprehensive and sustainable solutions can only be possible when child protection systems of countries of origin, transit, and destination regularly talk to each other and exchange information about each and every case. And I repeat, each and every case, countries are not talking with each other and children are going missing. Otherwise, as experience often shows, a lack of effective communication will only uh, continue to have far-reaching consequences on children and a serious impact on the course of their lives. So in this regard, our publication on establishing national focal points for child victims of trafficking can be a useful tool which, states, um, which can help states in their cross-border communication. I encourage you to read it if you haven't done so. I'll post it in the chat in a little bit. Another important angle that uh, you are going to discuss today is technology facilitated trafficking and its devastating effect on children. As many of you might know, the nexus between technology and trafficking has been a major priority for my office over the last three years. And today's event is another confirmation of how important it is to talk about safety of children and adults in the virtual space. Just a couple of weeks ago, we published a report on policy responses to technology facilitated trafficking, an analysis of the current situation and considerations for moving forward. This report provides an analysis of how tech facilitated trafficking has been approached policy and legislation wise across the OSC region. One of the major findings of this paper is that the current approach of states to let tech companies self-regulate with voluntary compliance is just not working. 
This is perhaps most obvious in the realm of online exploitation of children, which we heard yesterday is just skyrocketing, skyrocketing. The paper also provides a set of recommendations for how states uh, can use policies and legislation to combat human trafficking while respecting other fundamental rights like privacy and freedom of expression. One of the crucial areas for action is the need for age verification. And I don't just mean for children who might visit websites with explicit material, but I also mean for um, ensuring that the people depicted in that material are not children, which is so often left out of the conversation. As we all know, the policy advice and practical tools and instruments are out there. They're out there, but it's high time we started to implement them. So with that, I'll conclude it because I'm really excited to listen to the great list of speakers we have today, but I wish you a fruitful discussion and look forward to hearing more about its outcomes. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Val. And we're very grateful with the good cooperation that we have with your office. And I especially appreciate you highlighting that expectation of children is actually increasing and that, that we therefore urgently need to improve the child protection system, as well as the exchange of um, information across borders. And also, uh, I want to thank you for your efforts to address technology facilitated trafficking, including uh, the recent policy uh, paper that you mentioned, which I think is a really valuable tool um, in this field. So thank you for that. Um, I now want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Morgan Nicole, uh, the Human Trafficking and Migrant Smuggling Knowledge Development and Innovation Team Leader at UNODC. And I wanted to ask you, Morgan, in light of the recent developments and how child trafficking is occurring, and in particular, uh, technolo technology facilitated trafficking, as mentioned by Val here as well, how relevant now is the Palermo Protocol today? And how can practitioners uh, in the official sector, as well as the CSO sector, use existing international human rights instruments in this field? Thank you, Elise. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today and uh, to represent you and ODC in this very important conversation. Um, short answer is uh, yes, still absolutely relevant. <laughs> uh, the international framework uh, in itself, uh, when it was adopted uh, 20 years ago, um, children were really at the core of the, the discussions um, and, uh, and their place is still there. Um, what's important is that um, at the international level, the protocol against trafficking in person sets a common definition for almost all the states in the world. And, uh, and in that definition, uh, there's a distinction that's been made between adults and children. So for children, you only need to prove an act. So for example, the recruitment or the harboring and the intent to exploit. So for example, sexual exploitation. There's no need to bring evidence of the use of force, of adoption or abuse of a position of vulnerability, for example. Um, so in theory, it's much easier to prove than for adults, but that's proven that the, the, we can establish that the victim is a child, uh, and that's sometimes one of the obstacles. So there should be actually a presumption that um, of minority uh, when in doubt, when uh, age is being assessed. Uh, so that, that could be a first obstacle, but something that needs to be uh, paid uh, um, attention to. Um, also worth noting is that the protocol is an international instrument, so it's a global one, and it sets a, a minimum uh, requirement for states uh, that together with the model convention, which is the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, also requires the liability of legal persons for human trafficking. Uh, so that's also a very important point. Um, and, uh, and as we've seen uh, and documented in the 2020 global report on trafficking in persons, there's been an increased use of the internet for the facilitation of trafficking in persons. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, this has been directly linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen that inter internet service providers and websites, chat rooms, social media platforms have increasingly been targeted for litigation regarding their role in hosting and promoting human trafficking material, and most notably uh, produced in the form of online sexual exploitation. Um, and, and that's the thing, there's the international framework, but there's also what national uh, legislation, what states do with that. And that's what's very important is uh, the national uh, legal framework. So for example, in the US, uh, the FOSTA, which is the Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, that was adopted recently. It expands the liability of legal persons for human trafficking to social media companies and internet service providers when they should have known 
that a user was abusing the platform for online sex trafficking. And based on this act, uh, the Supreme Court of Texas has recently allowed underage victims of sexual exploitation to make claims against Facebook and Instagram that were related to the actions of the traffickers who use those social media platforms to lure victims into trafficking. Um, so, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic has been really global uh, and has impacted many different regions. In the Philippines, for example, uh, with, uh, the authorities have noted a threefold increase in the reporting on uh, uh, online sexual abuse and exploitation of children. And as a result, the Philippines have very recently amended the Anti-Trafficking Act to both capture the use of the internet in the context of trafficking in persons, as well as allow the use of technology by investigators themselves uh, which could include the use of court authorized wiretaps, which was not possible before. Um, now, at the global level, UNVC is also currently supporting states' efforts to uh, develop a new international instrument, um, which uh, would address specifically uh, cybercrime, cyber criminality. So let's see how this also unfolds, because that, that would uh, most likely be relevant. But um, as I concluding, I would like to um, to stress that at the international level, you do have many other uh, instruments that are directly applicable to the situation of children who are being exploited uh, by online means, uh, which uh, you know the Convention on the Right of the Child and its protocols, Refugee Convention, Human Rights, all apply together, and that's something that the protocol also reiterates. So let's let's make it all work together through national law. Uh, and uh, yes, it sometimes requires uh, expert uh, expertise to be able to make it all work together, but that's what the legislature at the national level is also there for. We can accompany that. And, um, and as I'm concluding, uh, obviously the advantage of uh, qualifying uh, trafficking in persons uh, against children as trafficking is that it provides a protective framework to the children, which is very important. Uh, and that should kick in, um, in addition to the other potential poten um, protection frameworks that are offered by these other instruments. In particular, the protocol itself is requiring states to cater for the special needs of children, which includes appropriate housing, education, and care. Um, so I think there's plenty to tap into uh, by uh, all those intervening, but that it has to trickle down through the national, uh, the national uh, context as well. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much for that, Morgan. And thank you for particularly exp explaining uh, the continued relevance of international human rights instruments in this field. Um, and um, for, for children in particular also, and that uh, they set the minimum standard and that states and governments are the ones responsible for implementing them effectively, ensuring that new developments are sufficiently addressed. And also, um, I think it was really interesting to hear about your efforts to support states in addressing cyber crimes in this field as well. So I'm um, looking forward to having more contact <laughs> with your office to hear even more about that. So thank you again. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, to then also uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, the EU anti-trafficking uh, coordinator, um, Diane Smith. And I know you're very busy uh, these days, Diane, coordinating efforts to prevent human trafficking of people fleeing Ukraine, and especially children who are now particularly at risk. So I want to ask you, um, considering, uh, you know, cross-border cooperation can be very challenging. And as the EU anti-trafficking coordinator, how can these challenges be addressed in general and in relation to children fleeing Ukraine specifically? Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, thanks to child 10 but also to the council of the baltic sea states for the invitation to this event which is very important um, and um, let me first underline that uh, a child rights based approach is also our priority in the eu strategy on combating trafficking in human beings and the child rights approach is even more important now in this very difficult times with war going on in our neighborhood, um, where especially children are putting at risk of falling into hands of uh, uh, criminals. I mean, criminals who know no border, um, who are ready to do everything. So, um, I mean, you know that nearly 
million people have fled the war in Ukraine already. Half of them are children, uh, separated or isolated children. Around 3,500 have been registered as unaccompanied minors in EU countries. And trafficking human beings does not stop at the border. And this, what is happening right now, shows this again. And as you also rightly said, cross-border cooperation can indeed be a challenge in normal times and also in these specific times. But there are solutions. And um, immediately after the, the war started, uh, I think we have been quite active at EU level in order to ensure cross-border cooperation and coordination, starting also with uh, regular meetings of uh, the national rapporteurs, uh, the coordinators in EU member states in charge of trafficking in human beings in, in order to exchange uh, information and, uh, and see what has to be done in order to prevent uh, trafficking from happening, but also to take measures in order to stop uh, criminals. Um, we have worked very closely uh, with our EU agencies, uh, Europol, Frontex, Eurojust, the asylum agency, uh, CEPOL, which have also a big role to play in order to ensure this cross-border cooperation. We uh, have worked with international partners, while which is here, we have been in contact on a regular basis. Um, we have also worked with civil society organizations because also here, but in general, in relation to combating trafficking, civil society organizations have a big role to, to play. And I was uh, very happy also uh, uh, to join a, a, a mission to Poland where also civil society organizations were present to see the situation on the ground and to discuss with the authorities. Uh, and we also uh, worked with uh, neighbors uh, not part of the European Union, with Moldova, con confronted with the same, same, same challenges than our EU frontline member states and also directly with Ukraine, because at the end, we have to uh, raise awareness already on the other side of the, of the border. So, um, I mean, again, the objective of all this cooperation and coordination was and is still to prevent trafficking from happening. For the moment, we have no confirmed cases, there are suspicions, and there are investigations going on. Um, so we will see what comes out from the investigation, but they are, they, it's clear that there are clear risks. So the first priority, obviously, was to reduce the vulnerabilities of those fleeing, and especially also of children, to ensure protection. You know that uh, we have also presented a temporary protection decision in order to ensure this protection, access to education uh, for children. Uh, and also in the context of these um, uh, measures, prevention is in general key. So awareness raising about the risk, information about the rights, about where they can find housing, what can be done and so on, how they can be supported. And there I noticed that in general, um, uh, national authorities, but also civil, civil society organizations worked very closely one with the other and a lot of information was provided. From the European Commission uh, um, side, we also prepared um, a web page on the rights informing those fleeing Ukraine, also in Ukrainian language, uh, about their rights uh, uh, with also contact points in the different member states. And this page is updated on a regular ba basis. And there's also now uh, access to the, to the phone line of the commission uh, in uh, Ukrainian. Um, for children more specifically, one of the measures also on which we insisted a lot and still insist is that all the children should, should be registered so that we know about their whereabouts, where they will stay, uh, where they are staying, uh, uh, how, how, uh, who will provide transport, what is their final destination. Um, but on top of that, it's also extremely important to register entities or persons who offer transport and accommodation in general. And uh, we invited uh, member states uh, to do so. And as regards those who receive uh, temporary protection, we are also in the process of um, uh, setting up uh, uh, an EU platform in order that people are not only registered at national level, but this, that this, there's also contact, con connection across border, exactly what, what, uh, what you mentioned in relation to possible challenges. 
Um, if uh, children are not uh, accompanied or are separated, obviously a, a guardian should be immediately appointed. And this is also something we underlined in our guidelines on, on temporary protection. Uh, border guards, frontline officers, civil society organizations who come in contact with children should also, if needed, be trained and in a position to identify possible victims, uh, detect suspicious mm -hmm. signs. Um, uh, CEPOL, our agency, uh, is providing training, a specific training to law enforcement authorities. And this afternoon, uh, there is a, a specific webinar on invisible children identifying and responding to children victims of trafficking in the context of the Ukrainian crisis. Um, cooperation with law enforcement authorities and with Europol is also key. Uh, priorities have also been shifted to address security challenges related to Ukraine, including in relation to fighting um, trafficking human beings. I think Europol, again, our agencies have also to play a key role because uh, if something is happening, it's important, for example, that Europol is informed uh, through the national law enforcement authorities so that Europol can also um, connect the dots and uh, uh, identify possible new um, modus operandi or networks which might be people which might be active across border. The role also of, of UOGES is very important in case uh, there are cases which are identified um, and it's important that they're involved immediately in cross-border cases so that prosecution and conviction is also made easier uh, afterwards. Um, ensuring monitoring has to continue to take place. I, I mentioned there are investigations going on. Uh, there are vulnerabilities which might also appear perhaps later or cases of trafficking which might appear only in a few weeks or in a few months. So we have to closely uh, monitor the situation. And I think also one of the aspects you are discussing today is the online dimension. Uh, monitoring of what is happening online is also key because we have already signs that um, there are recruitments which take place or might take place online. And uh, there are also Europol and law enforcement authorities in the, in the member states uh, have a role to play and Europol is already active. Um, uh, you might know uh, that we are working not right now uh, after a request which was made by uh, also the 27 uh, ministers of interior. We are working on the common anti-trafficking plan to reinforce even more this, the coordination and address the risk of trafficking and support potential victims. Um, to combat uh, trafficking, obviously the anti-trafficking directive remains applicable all over the EU, including for, for persons fleeing Ukraine. And this directive, this EU legislation together with the EU strategy provides a robust legal framework on uh, prevention, detection, protection, uh, and support to victims and prosecution of traffickers. You, you, I think those who are present here know also that we are currently evaluating the directive in view of possible modification and they also will uh, take the online dimension better into account, which was perhaps not the case uh, 11 years ago uh, when the directive was uh, adopted. Um, I do not want to, to, to be too, too long, but um, perhaps only uh, a word on, uh, on uh, sexual exploitation online and uh, an upcoming initiative from the Commission. We are, colleagues are working right now on uh, legislation that will clarify the role uh, or, and responsibilities of companies. Uh, it might likely include targeted obligations requiring relevant companies to detect and report child uh, sexual abuse material to public authorities. We are also going to propose the creation of an EU center to prevent and combat child sexual abuse. I, uh, I will stop here. Uh, these are initiatives which will be presented by the European Commission in May and which might obviously also be of interest of those who are following us online today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diane. And uh, thank you for stressing the importance of a child rights based approach in all anti trafficking efforts. Um, and for sharing how the EU now is facilitating cross border and cross sectoral cooperation and the measures being put in place to reduce risks and increase protection of children. 
um, as well as the importance of working with civil society. And it was also really interesting to hear how you're working with a common anti-trafficking plan, which I think will be a really valuable tool in the current situation. And also um, what you are doing uh, to address uh, liability of online actors when it comes to commercial sexual exploitation of children online. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, our next speaker, Anna Ekstedt, the Swedish ambassador at large for combating trafficking in persons, had to unfortunately cancel this morning due to a family emergency. Um, so our next speaker is then Eddie Mujai, uh, a senior advisor in the Task Force Against Trafficking in Human Beings at the Council of the Baltic Sea States, which you know is also our co-organizer here today. Um, so Eddie, I wanted to ask you, in your experience working with governments um, in the Baltic Sea region specifically and supporting them in their anti-trafficking work, what are the main obstacles for governments to introduce the necessary protection mechanisms for children? Thank you, Liz, uh, for the question. Uh, I also want to thank the previous speakers and especially uh, the OSC Special Representative Val Wirtschief for joining us today. Um, to answer your question, I think the main obstacle is that these mechanisms for children do not exist, or that those mechanisms and child-friendly procedures uh, existing are not integrated with each other to the you know, extent needed. Uh, therefore, I think this is, it's very important that states, due to this reason, set up functioning national referral mechanisms. Uh, and I think the humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine proves how urgent this is, especially when we look at the numbers of children uh, arriving in the European Union and other European countries at the moment. Um, I think also this is a, an area, NRMs, where the EU could uh, really, you know, take a lead here in uh, assisting or at least guiding the member states on, on how to set up national referral mechanisms. And just a short remark is that there seems to be a very abstract understanding of what constitutes an NRM. Um, our impression is that institutions and states sometimes hesitate to initiate the process of setting up national referral mechanisms uh, until they get further practical uh, examples and best practices on how an NRM can be organized or structured and so on. Uh, here, uh, once again, I think the EU could have a very important role uh, in this aspect. I think it's crucial that the NRMs have a strong children's rights perspective, but not only that, I think it's very important that the NRMs thoroughly address child protection in detail and practically speaking. Uh, but we also know that in order to have a functioning NRM, it is crucial to have political will and uh, earmarked resources. And here I, I would really like to underline the need to increase the resources for law enforcement specifically because we see examples in our member states and in other EU countries that a successful national referral mechanism is set up and the authorities involved in the referral process do increase their capacity uh, and competence when it comes to identifying victims of human trafficking, both children and adults. Uh, but that their report on suspected child trafficking to the police um, ends up in, you know, all these cases being piled up at the different police authorities and that the uh, preliminary investigations are often closed down on a very early stage. Uh, we also see connection to that in studies commissioned by our member states that it's surprisingly common that preliminary, investi preliminary investigations are shut down even though the suspected child victims are never heard or interviewed by law enforcement, which is very, very alarming. Um, so operatively speaking, there are law enforcement challenges that very much hampers directly the overall referral and assistance of child victims. And I'm not talking only about the preliminary investigation phase, but also you know, the moment right before that, the early identification. Uh, would, I would also like to add that we see, of course, uh, that specialized police units uh, against human trafficking want to do more and are very keen on working against human trafficking, but there are no resources. Um, and again, I really want to underline that without functioning law enforcement and you know, prioritizing the issue of human trafficking in children, uh, no national referral mechanism will be you know, functioning the way it should be. Um, 
And we also see that when introducing national action plans against, let's say, human trafficking in children with earmarked money, and this is very important, we see a very clear increase in identification, assistance and referral and prosecution. Uh, and when it comes to setting up NRMs with a very strong child protection focus, I also want to highlight, uh, as some previous speaker also did, the need to involve survivors and or civil society organization when setting up these NRMs. Uh, they have a very important, uh, important part in the process of setting these up. And quite frankly, uh, the civil society organizations are crucial because we know that very often they save the day by you know, doing the things that the institutions do not always do. Uh, and I really thank the previous speakers for highlighting you know, the role of civil society organizations. I will finalize also by saying that we also see challenges relating to the lack of you know, competence, but also sometimes lack of sensitivity among law enforcement and other state institutions when it comes to the exploitation of children. There are still perceived notions on in most countries, I would say, uh, on how a child victim of human trafficking should behave and look like and so on, which I think is a really big obstacle in when it comes to identifying these uh, victims and absorbing them into our protection systems. And I want to end by also saying that we see that the Bona Hughes model is not being applied in the way it should or could be in cases of human trafficking. Um, we have here at the Council of the Baltic Sea States set up a draft transnational referral mechanism funded by the Swedish government offices. It was a two-year project. And this TRM includes our member states, including or also uh, Iran, Bulgaria, Romania, and Iran in Ukraine. And we will, during this year, uh, evaluate our TRM. And we will also, or we have initiated a two-year project funded by an EU-funded project which we will uh, carry out with our sister unit here at the Council of the Baltic Sea States, namely the Children at Risk Unit, where we will look specifically into how child-friendly procedures, such as the Bona Hughes model, can be integrated with national and transnational referral mechanisms, but because this really, uh, it's urgent that we do so. Um, and we will also look on how Bona Hughes can be applied concretely on uh, cases of child trafficking. Uh, I will stop here um, and uh, give the floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. And uh, thank you again for the great cooperation that the CBSS is having with the CSO sector and Child 10. So, uh, and, and also for reminding us of the importance of developing functioning child-friendly national referral mechanisms with sufficiently allocated resources. Um, and uh, also stressing the need to involve survivors and civil society organizations. Um, you mentioned uh, towards the end also uh, the Borna House model and the importance of that, which I know our next speaker will also talk about. So on that note, I would like to welcome Nadine Finch, an associate at Child Circle. And Nadine, I wanted to ask you from your practical and research background, how can we improve the child rights-based approach in national referral mechanisms, and especially when it comes to children on the move? Thanks very much, and thanks very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, many of my remarks will echo what's been already said by Eddie and by Diane, and I'm gonna try and uh, adopt what Eddie said, but also um, develop it slightly more. When looking at um, child protection models like NRMs or TRMs, I think it's essential to look at the breadth of children's rights that need to be addressed when children have been trafficked and are on the move. Um, I usually use the phrase um, children who may have been trafficked. And I think that's a really essential phrase because quite often the existing um, identification models actually only look at children who have been allocated that definition by the police or by sometimes by social services. And they're missing a huge amount of unaccompanied children moving around who probably have been trafficked, but without proper identification, they will be missed. Um, so it's not sufficient just to look at children who've applied for asylum or even children at the borders. As a previous um, speaker alluded to, children quite often are passed by um, when they're moving with traffickers across borders, but actually are trafficked. Now, police officers, judges, lawyers, social workers, doctors, teachers, migration officers, guardians, 
they all have a part to play in identifying children. Um, and their actions need to be coordinated, as Eddie said, they need to be coordinated at a national level initially, and later at a transnational level. For consistency and durability, I would argue that these systems need to be based in state procedures, not to say that NGOs don't play a really important part, but NGOs do not have the consistency of, of um, resources, and also they have more of a, of a moving picture in terms of their employees, and therefore it must be a state responsibility in alliance with NGOs, otherwise they won't be durable. In a recent Council of Sea States, a research project, um, which Charles Circle worked on with um, CBSS, which is called In Need of Target Support, we looked at six member states, some of whom had national referral mechanisms, but in my view and in the view of the research, they weren't national in any true sense of the word because they weren't comprehensive and they tended to be either embedded in child um, protection systems or in criminal justice systems, but they didn't look at the whole picture of the child. And also quite often the migration state of the child actually predominated and those children may be held in reception centers or they may be excluded from some services. Therefore, some professionals never came in contact with them. And that really hampered the identification of those children. In my view, um, the ability to identify trafficked children um, shouldn't be limited to one type of professional. Just to give some practical examples, social workers normally find it easier to identify children who've been trafficked for sexual exploitation because they probably have had child sexual abuse cases in their workload. But if they look at, say, a, a boy from Morocco on a street in Stockholm, they're unlikely to immediately think, has that boy been trafficked? They're more likely to think, is this a very young teenage um, criminal? Or if they find a child in a cannabis house, they will also not make the same connection. Now that's very important that that, that is not um, sustained because of course all, the, all those children are potentially victims of child trafficking. And also in terms of digital technology, it's not only gangs using that for sexual exploitation. The gangs are using the same technology um, and quite a sophisticated level to recruit and move children across borders for other types of exploitation. And certainly in my exploitation, children quite often age out of child sexual abuse into other forms of trafficking. As well, a migration official may be experienced enough to identify a child who's been trafficked because they may have been trained to look at the um, possible indicators, but they will not have enough understanding about child psychology and trauma to understand the need to perhaps provide that child with a residence card to encourage them to give evidence, or they may simply ignore a Roma child because that child has a right to travel within the Schengen area. So those children will not get into any national referral mechanism in its widest sense and will not be protected. Furthermore, a national referral mechanism or a transnational referral mechanism may recognize children's rights in the abstract. For example, the child's right to protection, to participate, the right not to be discriminated against or be separated from their family. But if these rights are not placed in a context of the lived experience of the child um, and procedures aren't put in place in the NRM or TRM that address those rights, um, these rights will not be meaningful. For example, a child who has been trapped for the purpose of criminal exploitation, their right to protection will not be a real right unless there's a formal link to a lawyer will be able to help the child show that they're not, um, they're a victim and not a perpetrator in the criminal um, enterprise of their trafficker. Similarly, a child who's been trafficked thousands of miles from home and subject to abuse on their journey cannot be expected to give the police and the prosecution the cogent evidence necessary to um, lead to a prosecution, which is what Eddie was alluding to without the involvement of a guardian and referral to a facility such as a Barna House for a trauma-informed interview. 
these children have been told what to say by traffickers. Um, in the UK, it's called the legend. And it's very, very difficult for those children to move on from that legend. And it needs a lot of work to get them to actually disclose what has happened to them. In addition, a Roma or a child with physical, med medical, mental, educational special needs may well continue to be uh, discriminated against unless all the professionals they come into contact with understand their particular histories and vulnerabilities. And we're already seeing that happen to the Roma children being assigned to separate and inferior reception centers in Europe. And also the many dis disabled children who are coming out of the Ukrainian social orphan, um, orphanages. Um, unless all professionals work together very closely in a national referral mechanism, it's likely that some professionals won't learn the skills or be provided with the data to actually address the needs of those subsets of trafficked children. Now, there is some um, examples of emerging good international um, multi-agency and holistic practice. Um, as Eddie said, the Barna House model is interesting for people who don't know about it. You bring together relevant professionals in one location and the child interacts with those various professionals in one location. Therefore, the child feels safer and it's more used to that location. And therefore, multi-agency work, for instance, having one interview with the child, which may involve more than one professional, a social worker and a police officer, is more likely to lead to both an interview whose contents are useful to other professionals, but also it means the child is more likely to be able to be consistent. If you continuously in, uh, interview a child, lots of research to show that they're the content of interview will degrade over time. It's most likely to be cogent at the beginning once they um, feel trust in the adults, but it would degrade over time more than adults will. In the United Kingdom, there are also what are called multi-agency safeguarding hubs, um, where a range of professionals are co-located in an office so that referral from a child who may have been abused, exploited and trafficked comes into that office and all professionals simultaneously look at that child and that child's circumstances. It's also possible because there's a shared data sharing agreement, which has all confidentially that Delta um, programs um, added to it, that they are able to look at that child with more intelligence than may be possible if the child just turns up at a police office station or turns up in a, a local social services office. Um, the hub works on an emergency basis because it understands that trafficked children can go missing very quickly. Um, and they also recognize that trafficked children are unlikely to have the paper record that other children who've been abused have. There's like unlikely to be much record about what happened at school, what happened in a the family. They may not even have identity. Um, cards, they may be stateless. So it's essential that the intelligence and data is captured very quickly. And at those hubs, there are usually police officers and social workers there every day, but they have health workers, teachers, um, psychoanalysts on call to bring in as need be. And it's worked very well. Sorry, uh, Dina, I'm going to ask to ask you to start wrapping up a little okay. bit. It's very interesting, but we're running out of time here. OK, can I just wait one one final thing? Um, yes. Let's talk about uh, data being essential. And I would say that there's a real need to combat digital experience of the gangs. But I'd always say that we quite often also overlook the input of the children themselves, because most of these children will have been uh, using social media on their journey. It may well be that the children's knowledge of social media will act add to the um, evidence needed to prosecute the gangs. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sorry for interrupting uh, you. It was very interesting. Um, but uh, thank you so much. It was so interesting. And, and, and also for you highlighting um, the challenges with identification of victims, in particular those in migration and the negative stigma surrounding unaccompanied minors and how that creates an obstacles 
uh, creates obstacles for identification and also stressing other children at particular risk um, and for sharing um, your uh, practical and research experience in this field, Nadine. Um, so our next speaker uh, will also share his vast practical experience working directly with child victims and children at risk. I'm very happy to welcome Tomislav Ramjak, uh, the Executive Director of Center for Missing and Exploiting Children Croatia, who is also a Child 10 Awarded member for 2022. And Tomislav, I wanted to ask you uh, what you find are the main challenges in child victims of trafficking's access to services and justice in particular in regards to the growing online dimension and how uh, cooperation between the CSO sector and the official sector um, um, is functioning in this field based on your experience. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this great panel. And just to say as an NGO, I totally agree with everything I heard today. Um, in front of us are really great challenges and it's really great to hear all these uh, uh, wonderful ideas and, and proactive uh, work that we do to protect the children online. But uh, from my previous experience as a director of the shelter for the children victims of the trafficking and currently as a court expert, I can say the big problem is classifying the crime and to grant the rights, uh, the, the rights to the child uh, to become the victim of trafficking, which is much bigger rights than the other victim. Whenever the, uh, there is a recruitment, uh, blackmail, intimidation, uh, exploitation in any form, uh, and the end, especially when someone makes a profit of it, the case should be treated as human trafficking. And I'm afraid that this is not the practice in many cases. Uh, the rights that the child has in this case are far greater than the cases conducted under the same uh, other criminal offense. Uh, unfortunately, the penalties for sexual, ex sexual exploitation of, of children via internet, um, especially in Croatia, are ridiculously small. Most of, often are community service, probation, or minimum imprisonment, which further uh, devalues the very act of the child abuse. I think there is a need uh, for additional speciali uh, specialization of prosecutors and judges in cases involving the internet or another form of technology, um, as well uh, as raising awareness of the severity of the trauma of sexual exploitation of children online, which I think it's not the case in most countries in this part of, of Europe, and I mean Balkan region. I think that uh, it is in this field of education and raising awareness between uh, should be better cooperation between uh, the civil society organization and the official sector. And I think that there is a lot of work in front of us. And I see many cases, especially as two years during the COVID uh, situation, that the regular children are becoming the victims of, of predators are being sexually exploited. And at the end, somebody sold those pictures, those images and make a profit. And I see that in Croatia, we don't have any rise of the uh, cases of the children who are victims of trafficking. So I think that uh, better cooperation between NGO and, and uh, the, the state, the prosecutors, the judges, especially when uh, we, uh, they need much more education is the best way to start with. And of course, awareness uh, and, and prevention work uh, is crucial because I think it's always better to prevent than to have than to save one victim. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Tomislav. And um, thank you also for expressing how victims of sexual exploitation are not always treated the same as victims of other forms of violence, which I know is a problem in many countries. Um, as well as the challenges with cooperating with, with law enforcement for civil society, uh, which I think is something that really needs to be strengthened. Um, I now want to warmly welcome our last speaker, um, Gabriella Sjernikul Wolf, who's a survivor leader, as well as the new Swedish Ombudsman against commercial sexual exploitation of children. And Gabriela, what do you find as key when talking about improving the official protection system for child victims and children at risk of trafficking and uh, commercial sexual exploitation? 
Thank you, Elise. As the Swedish Ombudsman against commercial sexual exploitation of children, my aim is to secure the right to protection, support, and justice for all child victims of exploitation. And to achieve this, I talk to victims and report on their needs and views and review how well the efforts of the state meet those needs. Apart from my role as Swedish Ombudsman, I am also the founder of Sweden's largest survivor organizations for victims of commercial sexual exploitation, called Not Your Whore. And as a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation as a child, I want to stress the importance of survivor inclusion, where we invite survivors to not only share their experiences, but engage in the discussion on combating commercial sexual exploitation of children, we will have greater success in crafting effective policies and practices. Survivors are the only ones who have first-hand knowledge of the reality of commercial sexual exploitation and the obstacles that victims face to gain access to protection, support, and justice. And it is together with other survivors during my work as a Swedish ombudsman, as well as in my work at Not Your Horde, that I have identified some keys to improve, to improve the official protection system for child victims. One of those keys, which I find is fundamental for child victims' access to their rights, is that society views all children as children up until the age of 18, and that society views all victims as victims with equal right to support and protection. And this might sound obvious, but in reality, victims' access to their rights vary depending on the circumstances around the exploitation, their ethnicity, their gender, and their age. While the commercial sexual exploitation of younger children is sanctioned as the sexual abuse it is, the exploitation of all older children is far too often viewed as something the child engages in of free will. This is an attitude problem in society, but it is also a judicial problem seen in most countries' criminal law. The exploitation of older children is investigated under laws on prostitution rather than laws on trafficking and sexual abuse, due to arbitrary reg regulations regarding sexual consent, despite international frameworks stating that a child can never consent to exploitation. The majority of survivors that I meet have not received protection, support, and justice when they have disclosed the exploitations to law enforcement, social services, or healthcare, as the exploitation has been viewed as voluntary prostitution, sexting, or even as a form of antisocial behavior. When reporting the exploitation to the police, no investigation is opened as the exploitation isn't even viewed as a crime. When reporting the exploitation to social services, child victims are being locked up in institutions to rehabilitate them from their antisocial behavior. The problem is also evident in the identification of child victims, where, where tools to identify child sexual abuse material often only recognizes prepubertal pre children as children. While there are many great efforts and mechanisms in place to combat commercial sexual exploitation of children, this will fail to reach the goal of eliminating all exploitation if only some victims are viewed as victims. We will not success if we limit our efforts to victims that meet the standard of the perfect victim. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriela, for that strong intervention and also for highlighting uh, not just the importance of survivor inclusion, but how to include survivors as experts. And also for stressing that all children uh, up until the age of 18 must be treated as children and enjoy the same protection as also younger children. So, so thank you so much, uh, Gabriela. I see that we do have time uh, for a few questions. Um, so. Um, I wanted to um, ask first, this is a post to Val Ritchie as well as Morgan and Nicole. Um, it's from Milan Aleksic, uh, the NGO Athena in Belgrade, Serbia. And um, um, the question is, can a common procedure be agreed and on which level related to determining age of children who have no personal documents? Uh, which is particularly needed for refugee and migrant children, and especially for unaccompanied children, as many of them travel without any personal documents. Determining their age sometimes appear crucial for providing them with appropriate support and decreasing risks of violence and exploitation. Um, let me know if you want me to repeat the question. I don't know, maybe um, um, 
Val, if you want to go first. I, I am not an expert in this area, but I know a little bit about it. And I'll, I'll make a couple comments and then maybe Morgan has some thoughts. But this is a topic that has come up repeatedly, not only in the conference uh, yesterday, but also in my country visits. It's a very challenging area. And I think the uh, principle that has uh, been part of the discussions that should be, uh, I think, at the forefront of our thinking is a presumption that the person is a child rather than a presumption they are not a child. And the reason for this is quite simple. The mistake of assuming that a child is an adult is much worse than the, than the mistake of assuming that a person who is an adult is a child. Uh, the same thing happens in the context of asylum. Um, the mistake of, of denying asylum to somebody who's entitled to it is much worse and a violation of their rights than by, by mistake granting asylum to somebody who's not entitled to it. And the problem with this is that there is a trend in some countries of um, focusing on potential abuse of such systems, for example, trying to be uh, presented as a, a child when in fact you're an adult, um, rather than focusing on the be best interests of the potential child. So the, the mechanism to do that, however, is very difficult and is beyond uh, my uh, technical expertise. However, I, I do think we need certain principles to guide how we move forward, and, and that would be one of them. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Morgan. Thank you, Val. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like you, I'm, I'm no expert in uh, edge assessment and I could not agree more with what you said. So uh, presumption of uh, uh, childhood is the first. Um, now it's also probably um, um, a matter of uh, going beyond uh, technical tests that are being used um, into the bones, for example, especially when we're looking at uh, uh, trans-regional movements uh, and adding uh, other aspects of uh, assessments such as uh, uh, culturally sensitive assessments, uh, psychological assessments, etc. But down the line, it's all about protecting, uh, protecting the victims and uh, assuming that their children in the first place is uh, as long uh, as there's a doubt um, that would be uh, the way to go. So I cannot be more precise in that uh, in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much um, for that. Um, I see there's several questions here, but we only have uh, three minutes left. Uh, maybe I, uh, it's not directed to a specific person within the panel, but there's a question from Erangel Torstedsen from Light Up Norway, also representing Light Up International, about pornography and how it presents a harmful narrative for children and youth in our society. And if there's measures we can take on an international level to protect children and youth from the harmful effects of pornography consumption. And I'm going to ask uh, you know, you again, Morgan, Nicole, you talked about uh, you know, cyber uh, crime um, and how you're supporting. Is this something that has been part of the discussion with some national governments uh, in terms of the effects of pornography and how that affects um, commercial sexual exploitation of children and how to address that? The discussions are ongoing at the moment and they are very, very technical uh, at to this stage. So um, yes, there are some discussions, but I would not say that it goes as far as uh, what the, um, uh, the question was about. Uh, but maybe your colleagues are working on the civil society side, actually have been following up on that as well. Um, Val, yes. Thanks. I, I think there's a, a number of things we can do. The first relates to the systems that facilitate the um, sort of um, uh, the harmful effects of pornography on children. And here I'm talking about online platforms. So I mentioned um, earlier our policy paper, there's an extensive discussion in there about the need for much better and broader age verification systems. Now, the problem is, is that there's often a pushback on privacy grounds. And my response to that is whose privacy are we talking about? Are we talking about the privacy of the consumer? Are we talking about the privacy of children who are, who are being harmed and, and potentially exploited online? So that the first is ensuring that we do a better job keeping kids off of sites where they're gonna see things they shouldn't. The second, however, relates to societal engagement. And here I'm talking about early childhood education, uh, robust, uh, education around gender equality and so forth. As a father of three boys, I'm acutely aware of the need to constantly communicate with them, constantly discuss 
uh, what it means, what, what ideas like consent and equality mean. And this needs to be mainstreamed more broadly in educational systems. So I don't think we can say it's only a tech company problem. It's also an educational problem and a societal problem and so forth. Thanks. Thank you so much for that and for that comprehensive answer and, and it sort of also um, um, encompasses a lot of the discussions that I know that we've had in Child 10 with our civil society organizations on this topic. So thank you. We have run out of time. So although there are more questions, I'm unfortunately, I think we should stop here. But I really wanted to thank all the speakers, first and foremost, for taking their time to participate in this side event. And also, of course, to our co-host, uh, the Council of the Baltic Sea States, and for all the participants for uh, uh, being so active in the discussion. And also, thank you to those speakers answering directly to some of the questions also in the, in the comment. And, and I'll see if we can see if we can uh, try to address some of the other questions also um, directly to uh, those that I post them. So thank you so much, everyone. And um, thank you for, for, for now.